And welcome back to a special edition of the Falcons Audible presented by at and I'm Derek Rackley and I'm back with my fellas DJ Shockley and Dave Archer. And yes, it is a special edition because the top two spots, at least as far as football is concerned, have been filled by the Atlanta Falcons. Arthur Smith has come over as the offensive coordinator previously with the Tennessee Titans and he now is the 18th head coach in Falcons history for the Atlanta Falcons. And then the same day it was finalized that Terry Fontenot comes over from the New Orleans Saints, longtime executive in the Saints organization. He will take over as the general manager role and those two will work side by side to build this organization back up to what the owner, Arthur Blank, wants and feels like the fans of Atlanta deserve. So we will talk a lot about what's going on with those two guys, the whirlwind that they're going through in their new positions. Uh, but real quick, before we get to the guys, I want to make sure I tell you what we've got in store. Again, reactions to the top two guys for the Atlanta Falcons. We'll talk about how is Arthur Smith going to duplicate what he did in Tennessee without some guy named Derrick Henry, because that was a pretty integral piece to the puzzle that he had up in Nashville. And we'll talk about the general manager, Terry Fontenot, as he comes over and he starts to analyze this roster. What are some of his first moves as a, mem as a member of the Atlanta Falcons organization? And then we'll talk a little bit about free agency in the draft and how those two guys end up working together to build this roster up to where they feel comfortable, to where week one, they're ready to be competitive and go out and win football games. And then of course, we'll just kind of look into our crystal ball a little bit look out in the future and see where we think things are going to go for the Atlanta Falcons so with that being said let me get to the fellas here because DJ and Dave they want to talk they like to talk and they've got good things <laughs> to say when they do talk uh fellas it's been a little while we've had some playoff action so DJ let me start with you let me get your first impressions when you heard of Arthur Smith being hired and Terry Fontenot coming over as the head coach now and the general manager those two positions well, when, when you first hear about it, obviously we we talked about it some weeks back about the candidates that can possibly roll into this spot. And uh, during that time, that's when I started to familiarize myself with a couple of these guys and wondering, okay, if this guy comes to Atlanta, what does it look like? If this guy comes, you know, where has this guy been? What has he done? And we finally settled on Arthur Smith and, and Terry Fano, and, and we got a chance to hear their press conferences. And one thing that I, I, I took away immediately was, these guys both have an understanding of who they are first off and what they want to do going forward. I was impressed by both guys. I thought both guys handled uh, the Atlanta media for the first time really well. Um, I thought they were asked a couple hard questions that were questions I'm sure a lot of fans wanted to know. Um, but I thought both guys were really sound in what they wanted to do. And a couple of things that stood out to me when Arthur Smith was talking and a lot of it was about the identity and, uh, how he came to this spot and his dad, all that kind of stuff. But the one thing he talked about uh, was being great up front. And I think that's exactly where it starts in the National Football League. I think it starts there in college. It starts there in high school. And that's the number one thing that he talked about is he's a guy who's played it. He's played offensive line. He's talked offensive line. And the fact that he's been there and done that and has a, a wherefore of how to teach these guys, I think was big. And then the one thing I took away from Terry, which was, was really – really good was him talking about his willingness to listen, learn, and adapt. And I think as a GM, that speaks volumes because you come in here and you have everything at your hands. You could do this, you could do that. There's so many different ways you can go. But the fact he says, hey, I got to have people around me who are smarter than me. Uh, I'm not going to have people around me who are just going to be yes people, but their willingness to listen, learn, and his ability to adapt, I think was huge. And some of the things he talked about. So, uh, the, the, the other thing that really struck me was he talked about sustained success. And I know that's probably one thing that a lot of Falcons fans are wondering, are we worried about what's going on right now? We're going to what's going on for the future. And I think sustained success, success means right now as well as the future. And I love to hear that part of it. So I was truly impressed by both guys, really bright guys. Uh, I can see why Arthur Blank and Rich McKay were really excited to have these guys a part of it. And, hey, Terry was a, the first one they interviewed. And – Terry Fondo talked about, hey, I went out and I interviewed these guys myself before even Arthur them said anything to me about it. That tells me he has the initiative to go out and see what he likes about these coaches. So I thought that was impressive as well. 
Yeah, DJ, a bunch of great points that you make there uh, as we get um, the, the dogs in the background that want to chime in too. There'll be your time as well, okay? <laughs> there will be your time to get the dogs into the show. You know, Dave, I think the interesting point here, though, is that the, the Falcons have two guys coming into this position that have not been in that position before. They have not been head coaches. They have not been a general manager before, which that's not always the case in the NFL. I mean, you talk about Jacksonville, even though Urban Meyer has not been an NFL head coach, he's been a highly successful head Head coach. So what were your first impressions after seeing Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot in their press conferences today? Well, the first thing that struck me is these are two guys that are very humble. And uh, DJ talked about listening. I think that's why they've risen in the ranks of where they are is because uh, they're very humble. They're very thankful for their opportunity. Something that, that Terry Fontenot said in his comments, he says, I was, my goal was not to be a GM in the National Football League. My goal was to do the best possible job with the opportunity I was given. He was also asked about uh, how did you pitch yourself to the team? So I didn't pitch myself to the team. I told him who I was. These are my values. This is what my philosophy is. And I was very transparent of who I am. And if that fits with the Atlanta Falcons, which it did, then so be it. He says, I have a good job in New Orleans. He probably was the heir apparent to Mickey Luna, Loomis for the job in New Orleans. So uh, he felt like the fit was perfect in Atlanta. He loved the ownership group. And how do you not? I don't know there's a better owner in the National Football League than Arthur Blank, another uh, a better guy that's just under the owner than Rich McKay, a guy you can bounce stuff off of that's been around the league as long as, as, long as he has. So I thought that those are the, the humble part about it. And then the accountability that they talked about, accountable, being accountable for their actions, making their players accountable, their best players accountable. They were in lockstep with a lot of these things. And, and you kept hearing about how they'd only known each other for a couple of days or talked to each other a few times, but the words that came out of their mouth were the same words. And so the vision came together very quickly as far as them being in lockstep as to how this thing is supposed to work. And one other thing that I thought Terry Fontenot, just to kind of sum up what both of them feel, how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. That stuck in my eyes. I said, wow, that that's powerful. You know, you know, that's not something that, uh, that you hear all the time. And I know he's, he has, a, he, he has the ability to pull some quotes from some very, from very smart people, but that that's a good one there. How you do everything, how you do everything or how you do anything is how you do everything. I thought that that was pretty impactful. You know, I read uh, some of the social media reaction on the news about Terry Fontenot and everybody was just putting their stamp of approval that he should be the guy for the job for the Atlanta Falcons. And we kind of all talked before we got on the podcast that we were all impressed with Terry Fontenot. It just seems like he's a very polished, knows what he wants, but to DJ's point also realizes that just because he's the boss, if you will, it's not that he has all the answers he's going to lean on other people to give them insight as he called it layer of information continue to deliver him layers of information on how he's going to end up help building this franchise and getting them competitive I think it's interesting here fellas I wanted to point out Terry Fontenot when he talked about Mickey Loomis as you mentioned Dave he got pretty choked up today so you could see how important Mickey Loomis was in developing him taking a chance on him as a marketing intern way back when when he was at Tulane in college and growing him up through the ranks teaching him basically everything that he knows but terry also said that we're probably not going to have a whole lot of conversations anymore as rivals in the same <laughs> division so he's not necessarily going to have that person to lean on but <laughs> arthur smith on the other hand which is really intriguing he will have somebody to lean on as his father is the founder of fedex now granted arthur blank in his own organization is a guy that knows how to grow a big time organization but how about picking up the phone and saying, dad, I'm about to run this huge organization. <laughs> Can you help you me? Did a, you did a pretty good job at FedEx. You got a couple <laughs> of tips for me. I mean, talk about that insight. Gosh, that would be phenomenal. So yeah. I want to, I want to real quickly, Mac, ahead, Rack, let me add to, to Fred, what Frederick Smith brings to the table, the, the father of Arthur Smith. He's also a, a war hero. This is a guy that spent time in Vietnam, led men into battle. And so when you start talking, we always kind of compare sports to wrongly, by the way, but we compare sports to, to battle and or, and or service in the armed forces. He actually was in Vietnam, bronze star, silver star winner, led guys into battle, had to call in artillery strikes in a position where he was to help save lives, rescued a number of people. 
yeah, you, you talk about leaning on a dude that built a built a multi million dollar billion dollar operation at FedEx. How about the fact that he just led guys into battle? That's a pretty good one <laughs> to be able to lean on as well. Yeah, he's uh, he's got some resources as far as uh, making sure that he runs this thing from the top properly. And DJ, I wanted to pick your brain because let's talk a little bit about the action on the field and let's stay on Arthur Smith here because as soon as you heard about the news for Arthur Smith, you did a couple breakdowns on what made him such an effective play caller for Tennessee. I think the biggest thing to note here, and we talked a lot about it during this podcast throughout the course of the season, was the lack of the running game, the presence in the backfield for the Atlanta Falcons. Now, Arthur Smith had it when he was in Tennessee. He had some guy that named Derrick Henry that just rushes for over 2,000 yards and maybe one of the most <laughs> feared running backs in the National Football League. So how does Arthur Smith do it in Atlanta without a guy in the backfield, at least as of right now, like Derrick Henry? You know what? I, I had a chance to uh, talk to Ben Jones, who is the starting center for the Tennessee Titans. And I kind of just picked his brain on what is Arthur Smith like? What is this offense like? And the things he does. And in the 15, 20 minutes I talked to him, he talked about how detailed Arthur Smith is in his play calling, in his design. He, he talked to me about how, the offensive line is looking at, is it quarters? Is it quarter, quarter halves? If we got a, a hangover player, what they're doing here. And that is a direct correlation coming from the offensive coordinator and their coaches on how they prepare weekly. And yeah, Derrick Henry is a star. Yes, we all know that he's a big physical downhill back. And yes, he's deserving of all the credit. But the more I went into the film, the more I dived in, there were times where Derrick Henry wasn't getting touched until he was into the second or third level. And that's because of the way he created run game. And you talk about formation, you talk about motion, you talk about using different shifts, you're talking about putting guys in position to get the right block. And we're talking about angles, we're talking about all these X's and O's kind of stuff. But it's simple stuff when you watch the film that allowed them to be one of the top rushing attacks in all of football. So when you talk about Arthur Smith, it's more to it than just Derrick Henry. It's more to it than just Ryan Tannehill the way he prepared his players week in and week out. And I went through five, six, seven different uh, games, and it wasn't just one game they were doing this. They were doing this every single week. So it shows you each week they have the ability to, to adapt for one. We talked about already, but to be able to change up what they do, but then find ways to create it for their players. And I, I think the one thing that he talked about is we're going to make sure we use our personnel to its, to, to its best ability. And I think that's the number one thing is when some coaches come in, they say, all right, it's going to be my scheme. And this is what it's going to be about. The first thing he said is it's all about players, not plays. And I think that is the number one thing as a play caller. If you understand, I have a, a, a set amount of guys who can do this. I have a couple guys who can do this. And then using those plays to fit those guys, I think is tremendous. And Arthur Smith is a guy who uses a multitude of ways to create plays for his playmakers. And I saw it throughout the film. I saw it in the run game. I saw it in the pass game. Uh, I saw him change up personnel, change up uh, formation. I mean, he does so many different things. And at the line of scrimmage, it's going to be fun to watch this team. I, I, I text Arch about it, and I say, you're going to be excited. I'm sure he's seen it through and through, but he's going to be excited to be able to call these games because of all the things that he does to give his guys a chance to win. And I just pre-snap, but post-snap. Yeah, and, I, and Arch, I think you can appreciate here because, you know, you look at uh, the Tennessee Titans offense, and I think Arthur Smith has been getting the credit for kind of reviving Ryan Tannehill's career by how he's been able to work with the personnel within that offense. Again, right now, we're the Falcons like they're not going to have a guy in the backfield like Derrick Henry, but maybe it's the creativity. And the other thing Arthur said in his press conference was adaptability, Dave, and, and speak to a little bit about how you feel like he needs to be more adaptable, maybe than the Falcons have been in the past to use some of the weapons that he has right now and some of the other ones that they're likely going to bring into this organization. Yeah, let's look at what he did just from 2019 to 2020. That offensive line in Tennessee gave up 53 sacks in 2019. Okay, that was a shared quarterback du duty between Marcus Mariota and with Ryan Tannehill, 53 sacks. This year, they gave up 25 sacks, and that was with Taylor Lewan missing the better part of three quarters of the season with a blown ACL, 
And Ty Sombrello, yes, Ty Sombrello had taken over at left tackle. He got hurt. So you had three different guys playing the left tackle position. Their ability to adapt, as you guys have talked about, and that's been an operative word. Is it an operative word that both these guys spoke about? Their ability to be adaptive to the personnel they had. To me, that speaks volumes, the ability to adjust that big group up front. He says we our standard along the offensive line is we're going to be great up front. And that that's where you're that, that's the brick and mortar guys of the house. If we can get after people physically, that helps the run game, that helps the passing game. Um, yeah, nobody has there's not a bunch of Derrick Henry's out. In fact, there's one. But there's other people that run the football. And there's other guys that can get that job done if you're providing the opportunities. Like Shock Ted said. The ability to prepare guys to know what they're looking at and make adjustments. Again, the word adapt to what you see based on strength of formation or personnel's outnumbering. Ryan being prepared to change the play to an uh, to an uncovered or outnumbered look to the other side to get the run game going. These are all things that, that are very exciting to me. Uh, and Shock and I both played the quarterback position to know that you're going to have options to be able to get to at the line of scrimmage so you're not running the football into a stacked front or you can throw the football if they're trying to crowd you at the line of scrimmage. Hey, I Rack, mean, Rack, let me add yeah. one thing to what uh, Arch just mentioned um, about the ability to do stuff at the line of scrimmage. I asked Ben Jones, I said, and, and this is two different things. He, he said when he found out Arthur Smith was going to be gone, he immediately called him, texted him or whatever it was and said, hey, I know Alex Smith may be gone. I know, uh, I mean, Alex Mack, excuse me. Uh, he may have a chance to leave, whatever it may be. Don't forget about me. I would love to come <laughs> to play for you in Atlanta. But the second part of this was I asked him, who has the responsibility of the line of scrimmage? Is it, is it you or is it the quarterback? How much of you guys work together? And this is his quote. He said, we literally can change every single play at the line of scrimmage to whatever we want. If there is a situation where we're in a certain play, and it doesn't fit or it doesn't look good or it's going to be a negative play, the quarterback has an opportunity to change any play in the playbook at any time. And the freedom at the line of scrimmage for a quarterback is like gold. Arch just told you, the ability to be able to do that in line of scrimmage and not be caught in a play is tremendous. Well, and if, and if that ends up being the case and Matt Ryan is still the starter, you'd like to think Atlanta is going to be in pretty good shape because of all the experience and all the reps that he's had throughout his storied career would probably have a much higher up leg on a younger quarterback and being able to make all those adjustments to get the offense in the right play for them to have some success offensively. So we talked a lot about Arthur Smith. I want to, you know, we, we could sit here and we could probably talk for 45 minutes to an hour about him, but let's switch gears a little bit and talk about Terry Fox know here because there's obviously a big personnel end of this and he's going to be kind of the orchestrator if you will as far as adding new pieces to the puzzle that are going to help Arthur Smith achieve what he wants to do offensively and for this entire team defense and special teams because they all talked about the three phases of the game and Arch I want to talk with you about Terry Fontenot he was very quiet today during his press conference on any personnel he didn't feel like it was fair to be talking about personnel at this moment before he and whoever the rest of his staff ends up being have a chance to discuss it so I can appreciate that but let's put you in his shoes from a personnel standpoint give us one or two things give the fans one or two things that that you as Terry Fontenot as the general manager would be taking a deep look at from this roster from the personnel standpoint to help them improve in 2021 well there's a I wrote down uh, a couple of areas from a from a personnel standpoint uh, number one is uh, probably the edge of your defensive front. What, what are you going to do there? What can you do? Obviously, there's some salary cap implications that might hamstring you a bit in free agency. There are a couple players that potentially present themselves in the first couple rounds of the draft that are intriguing. Another position is the safety position. You're going to have to make some adjustments there. We know Keanu Neal's deals up. We know I don't, Ricardo Allen. Are you going to bring Ricardo Allen back at safety? Demonte KZ's coming off of a blown knee. Are you looking to add a safety? I, I wrote down five safeties that are going to be, be available in free agency that might be affordable. How about the running back position? There's four or five running backs. Chris Carson, a local kid, played high school football here. He's a guy in Seattle that's carried the mail up there. You've got a guy like that uh, that could be potentially they're available. Then also we talked about potentially the last time we got together about maybe trading where you move back and garner some picks. There's some really good players in the draft that are going to be available to, to address the running back issue. That's just a couple 
the one question I have for you guys, and, and you guys help me out here, what are we doing at left guard? What's happening there? And is that a scenario where you see Jake Matthews slide inside and play left guard? Does he slide inside to play there? And now all of a sudden that number four pick is used on the big fellow from Oregon or, you know, just another thought as to what potentially number four could be. I know there's a lot of talk about quarterback and this, and Terry Fontenot talked about drafting and being able to stock up L strength. Hey, if there's a strength guy there, it's the best player available. Even though if we got a player there that may be playing for the next year or two, we can still draft a guy there. He's not going to shy away from that. But there's a guy sitting there that's supposed to be a generational left tackle that might be available. Could that help fix your offensive line? Yeah, and and one of the things that he talked about is he kind of comes from that mindset of best player available and not necessarily reaching for Mm -hmm. a need, which we talked a couple of weeks ago about a guy named Greg Rousseau, I believe is his name, the guy kid out of Miami that's a pass rusher. But I think we all kind of agreed without saying it that at four, that's probably a little bit of a stretch, right? right? And so- If, if now that Terry Fontenot is the general manager, I don't think that that guy is in the mix as of right now. Granted, it's really early on. Maybe he goes and he dazzles during his pre-draft prep, but he's not necessarily going to reach just because they need a pass rusher. But what happens if a Devontae Smith, they feel like is the best player available at number four. They feel pretty good about wide receiver. Maybe he goes there just because his belief is best player available. So DJ, I'm going to ask you the same question. Personnel perspective, Terry Fontenot, now the general manager, what moves are you making to help rebuild this roster? I think Arch made a bunch of great points and they are similar to some of the things I think about when I think about this roster, where do you head, where do you go? Uh, Some key needs. One point that I think uh, I would pose to our group and pose to fans as well is if you don't get that guy at four you want, or at four you think you can move back, maybe you get a couple picks in that first round. Here's something to think about. Arthur Smith now is a guy who uses two tight ends a lot. There's a guy coming out from Florida named Kyle Pitts. We got Hayden Hurts. We also have an opportunity to get another tight end. He uses tight ends a lot. There's a lot of 12 personnel. There's a lot of 22 personnel. He uses tight ends a lot. Here's another opportunity where – Hey, if you're able to go get a running back you want, if you're able to go get a defensive end you like, well, here's another playmaker for you on the offensive side of the ball to go with these receivers as well. So you pose some different questions. And like Art said, there's going to be options. Four is going to be a good spot. You're going to have a chance to do whatever you want there, depending on what happens before you. But you're going to have an opportunity to move. You're going to have an opportunity to stay there. But there's going to be some prime spots. And I think Arch mentioned it. I don't have to repeat it. But those are all quality spots, as well as one other spot that we've talked about the last couple of weeks is on the other side of A.J. Terrell. Who's going to be that guy who can solidify that spot? I think the, the guy that Arch was allu- uh, alluding to was a guy like Patrick Sertain who can go on that other side. And you've got two shutdown corners in a league where you know it's going to be a pass frenzy league, not just even in the NFC South, but in the entire league, teams have two, three receivers. Look at us here in Atlanta. We got a bunch of receivers. There's not a lot of DBs that can match it. If you can get another guy on the outside of their corner spot too, that bodes well as well. Yeah, there's definitely plenty of options with that number four pick. And I think you guys have talked about a couple of scenarios where maybe Atlanta ends up trading back because DJ for a Kyle Pitts, four might be a little bit of a stretch for him, but 10 or 11, probably a little bit more in his range. And right. and if, if Atlanta decides to go quarterback and it doesn't end up being obviously Trevor Lawrence or a Justin Fields, maybe they end up trading back a little bit and you still get a Lance out of North Dakota State or something like that. Again, a lot has to happen between now and then to see where these guys actually end up slotting. And again, we could sit here and look up at mock drafts on the internet all day long. It only (laughs) matters what Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith and the rest of their staff, how they end up ranking the board. That's the only thing that matters uh, when it comes to the Falcons and who they're actually going to address. And, you know, the other thing we talked about, guys, we're not going to dive too much into it here is the salary cap obviously plays a huge part in a lot of this that goes on because we've talked about the draft, but there's a free agency that ends up being a very integral part of building your roster as well. But it's tough to dive into that right now with the salary cap. And if you're one of those X's and O's or excuse me, dollars and cents type people, there's plenty of websites out there where you can learn about the salary cap. Because as Dave talked about before we got on this podcast, there's one, maybe two guys in an organization that could actually explain how a salary cap works. So if you're Joe Schmo watching the podcast in your living room and you've got the answer Put your application in for a team because if you can figure out the salary cap, right? That's like us. 
it's three of us over here, and Archer's the only guy who knows about salary cap. So that's pretty much how it goes in organizations, too. I bluffed oh, my I bluffed my way through it. You guys bought it. <laughs> well, hey guys, I wanted to uh, let's let's kind of end this with this thought because we've talked a lot about both of these guys that have gotten their careers started with the Atlanta Falcons. Arthur Smith is the head coach. Terry Fontenot is now the general manager. A lot of work ahead for those two guys. Probably going to have very little sleep the next few weeks. Probably going to have a whole lot of phone calls and text messages, whether it's congratulatory or calling people to build out their staffs. But let's just take a look ahead. And again, it's hard to really assess what it's going to look like because these guys have not been leaders of an organization, whether it's a general manager or a head coach. But DJ, after what you saw today, how excited are you for the future? And and I don't want to sit here and say, did they get the right guys? Because that's such a cliche question. But what stuck out to you that gives you promise for 2021 for the Atlanta franchise? Right. This is something I learned a long time ago. And it's helped me become the, the man I am today. And it's first impressions are everything. And today was my first impression of Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot. And I was truly impressed by the way they handled themselves in their press conference. Now it could have gone a number of ways. Of course, there's going to be a lot of time to tell about how these guys, you know, really work out in this organization. But when I look at Terry Fontenot, there are two things that really stuck out to me. This guy is so personable. And you think about, if you watch their press conference, you saw him bring his kids on there. You saw he talked about how excited they were. He talked about now there's going to be a bunch of Louisiana Falcons fans now. And then the other part that really impressed me was at the end, before he started, you know, getting questions, he did something he didn't have to do. He made an acknowledgement of a guy that we all know very well, Von McClure, and went on a, 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 you know, a nice little soliloquy of, you know, five, 10 minutes about what Vaughn meant to him, what he meant to a lot of people. And I thought that was, that was paramount. That's him. Like, that's something you can't fake. That's something that, you know, he's in a, a major position and this was all about him. This moment, this press conference was all to talk about him and his new spot, this new job. But he wanted to, you know, kind of, you know, afflict uh, and get it to his, his family, get it to Vaughn, talk about all the people around him that helped him get to this spot. You talked about it. He, he choked up talking about Mickey Loomis. Like that kind of stuff tells you what kind of person a guy is. And then listen to Arthur Smith being in the position. And the one thing that I heard, Coming in, I'm going to keep it all the way, Ricky, 100. Everybody talked about, ah, I don't know how he's going to be with the media. He really hasn't had much training. I thought he was awesome. I thought he handled himself well. I thought he answered the questions that were presented in front of him and didn't shy away from anything. So uh, first impression for me are everything. And both those guys uh, kicked it straight through the uprights and uh, maybe the first touchdown of the year for me, for sure. <laughs> all right. Hopefully uh, the first of many to come. Uh, <laughs> for the Atlanta Falcons. Arch, you're going to be, speaking of touchdowns, you'll be calling many of the touchdowns as the analyst for the Atlanta Falcons radio network. And so again, after you saw Fontenot and Arthur Smith today, just give us your kind of overall impressions and your excitement level now that you know the two, top two guys outside of Arthur Blank and Rich McKay that are going to be running this organization from a football perspective moving forward. Yeah, I'm ecstatic, guys. I, I really was impressed with both guys. I would concur with, with shock. I thought both guys handled them extremely well. Well, remember, this was a press conference for the coach at one o'clock. It was a press conference for the GM at three o'clock. And you heard adaptive, you heard accountability, you heard consistent. Both of them said the same things. And not that somebody was beating on their head or handed them a script. This was all stuff that they believe in together. And that's pretty cool that you got two guys that are in lockstep with one another that well. The question I have, guys, uh, is for, co for, uh, for Terry Fontenot is – how does he get rid of all the Saints stuff? You know, how do you can't bring any of the Saints stuff to Atlanta, right? And his family, I, he's, he even made reference that it says Saints on his credit card. He says he's got to get his credit card back. So um, you talk about it, and, and it, it's funny, and we could go tongue in cheek with it, but think about it. This is a guy who grew up in Lake Charles. His wife grew up in Lake Charles. They got married in New Orleans. He's been with the Saints since he was 22. He's 40 now. His kids don't know anything but going to Saint games and, and cheering on Drew Brees. And I thought it was really cool right near the end of the press conference. He brought Caden, his little boy up, who probably, what, seven, six, seven years old. And one of the guys in the press corps said, uh, hey, Caden, who's your, who's your favorite football player? Yeah. He said, Julio Jones. <laughs> I said, wow, you yeah. talk about being buttoned up and oh, ready to man, go now. Man. The family is dialed in. They're ready. <laughs> 
I mean, come on, with a kid that age, how easy would it have been to say Drew Brees <laughs> yeah. or sure. Michael Thomas or yeah. something like that? So yes, it's it's almost right, like for Terry goodness Fontenot sake, he didn't even have a he didn't even have a red tie. He said he had to go get a red tie literally <laughs> right before the exactly. press conference. That tells you how long he's been. Oh with man, the Saints and not having any red and black. <laughs> two humble two humble guys that both mentioned leadership by servitude, and, and that's who they are. That's who they kind of came up kind of grew up through the ranks. Some of it was a little quicker maybe for Arthur Smith than it was for uh, for Terry Fontenot, but they both worked their way up. And you, you can't say enough about Arthur Smith being retained by three different regimes in Tennessee, kept him as a coach. That doesn't happen. You might be kept over one time to be carried over three different times. And really it was four times because Malarkey and, and uh, Wisenut kind of shared the duties uh, after uh, Munchak. So it was actually four coaches that kept him in Tennessee. Tells you a little bit about who he is. And then be giving, being given the offensive coordinator duties his final two seasons and improving on what they were doing in 18. Oh, yeah, by the way, that guy in 18, he's now the head coach in Green Bay. That worked out pretty <laughs> yeah. good, right? And this guy blew his numbers out of the water as the offensive coordinator. For and that guy, and that guy tried to steal him, too. LaFleur, he tried to steal him. <laughs> pretty good. Pretty good. <laughs> Well, here, here, I'll I'll leave it with this. Uh, my my impressions are really quick. I thought Arthur Smith, he looked like a football coach. Sometimes you get a head coach that gets up in there and they steal the press conference because they're so they're so clean and buttoned up and they got the three thousand dollars suit on. But when I saw Arthur Smith, I saw a football coach, and you know what? <laughs> That's perfectly fine no doubt. because I want this guy to know X's and O's better than everybody else in the league. I want him to be able to make adjustments better than anybody else in the league. I don't need to have that guy know how to do the sweetest tie knot in his tie. Okay. Terry Fontenot, on the other hand, he was really polished. I was impressed by his professionalism. I was impressed by his plan, even though he said that being a general manager wasn't his plan. So I feel like the Falcons are in really good hands with these two, even though these two don't know each other that well. I'm sure they've been on the phone a whole lot these last few days trying to get to know each other better because they're going to have to work hand in hand over the next, hopefully, a long number of years. Let's say 5, 10, 15 years, because we know sometimes the NFL stands for not for <laughs> All right, uh, that's going to wrap it up on behalf of DJ Shockley and Dave Archer, just bringing the thunder as always. And DJ <laughs> says he keeps it 100. Arch, you keep it 100 as well. That's right. Uh, we thank you for joining <laughs> us on the uh, Falcons Audible presented by AT&T, a special edition to talk about the Atlanta Falcons' new head coach and general manager. And guess what? There might be some more breaking news coming down the road, and you'll get us three back on, and we'll be here to talk about it. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Once again, on behalf of DJ and Arch, I'm Derek Rackley saying so long. This is the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Take care. You're listening to Falcons Audible presented by AT&T.